we're going to come to you. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Uh, as um, was mentioned, my name is Trey Granger. I'm the director of engineering over search and recommendations at Career Builder. Uh, we're, we're an East Coast company, so I'm from Atlanta. Uh, and uh, I was yeah, very happy to be here tonight to talk with you guys about searching on intent, knowledge graphs, personalization, and contextual disambiguation. So before I get started, uh, just a quick show of hands. Uh, how many of you guys actually work on a search engine? Years ago. Most of you guys. Um, who's using Solar? Who's using Elasticsearch? Who's using something proprietary? And who's using something else? <laughs> okay. So th those are the big three. There's about three other people who are using something else. So I'm going to send over here. So, uh, at Caribbean, we use solar. A lot of the examples I'm going to show you tonight are solar, but the concepts are you know, generally applicable to any search engine that you use. So I try to keep it uh, fairly high level in terms of what I uh, talk about. Uh, to give you a little bit of background about me, I work at Career Builder. I've been there since 2007, where I was working as a software engineer. I was one of the founding members of our search team. Uh, I got my MBA in Management Technology from Georgia Tech. Uh, bachelor, my undergrad from Furman University, uh, taking a few master's classes at Stanford at the moment in, uh, in machine learning, data science, those kinds of things. And uh, as uh, was mentioned, I am the co-author of Solar in Action. Uh, my team and I also wrote a handful of research papers, uh, frequent con conference and meetup speaker, and I'm also the founder of Silly Access, which is a gluten-free search engine. So if you, you or anyone you know um, has to be gluten-free, you might want to check it out. Um, and I and most of my team are Lucy and solar contributors. Uh, and by the way, I have a copy of Solar in Action. Uh, Manny gave me the giveaway tonight, so I don't know if we have the ability to do a raffle or something at the end. If not, I'll find some arbitrary way to give a book away. Maybe so, if someone asks a great question, I'll give it to them. Um, I've also got uh, five copies um, I can give as ebooks that I'm going to give out to people who uh, tweet about the talk. And so, you know, the top five tweets that I think are the most interesting, I'll, you know, send you an e-book. So, or if you don't want my book, then whatever. That's fine, too. <laughs> uh, so the agenda for tonight, uh, I'll do a quick introduction about Career Builder. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with us, I'll uh, talk about my sort of general philosophy on information retrieval, uh, talking about uh, traditional keyword search, personalization and semantic search and how I can see them intersecting and overlapping uh, to build an ideal information retrieval engine. And then I'm going to spend most of the rest of the time talking about uh, searching on intent and specifically the semantic search piece of that equation, uh, what we've built at Career Builder and some of the inner workings of how the system works to be able to take in uh, a, a query from the user or to take in you know, a document. So in our, our case, we're in the job search domain, so a document might be a resume for a user or a document might, document might be a job um, that a job seeker is looking for. So how we can take in that text or take in a query and really parse it and understand it and uh, return back the most meaningful results to match the user's intent. Um, and so you'll see a couple of things on there. The, I highlighted in yellow the pieces that are in the uh, title of the talk. Uh, and then you know, everything else, um, we'll, we'll just throw them for fun. So at Career Builder, search is key to what we do. I would say it powers about 90% of our products. And so if you're familiar with this, uh, you know we have a job search engine. You can come to our site and search the moment for jobs. Uh, we also have a resume search engine. If you're a job seeker, you can upload your resume and say, I want recruiters to be able to find me. And then they can run a search for your resume. Uh, we power all of our site's autocomplete capabilities. Uh, our job recommendation engine, uh, we power our search engine as well. So uh, unlike, uh, I would say, most companies that have a, a standalone recommendation engine independent of their search engine, we actually leverage our search platform as the core matching engine to power our recommendations. And I can talk more about that uh, in just a bit. Uh, our resume recommendations are also based upon our underlying search technology, which is Solar. We also power uh, several products that are uh, doing supply and demand uh, within the market. So for example, all of the jobs that we have at Career Builder are considered the demand. Uh, all of the resumes we have are considered the supply within the market. And we leverage solar to do sophisticated data analytics, uh, you know, facets or in Elasticsearch, they're called aggregations, 
uh, it's, it, you know, the general idea of just slicing and dicing the data so that a, a recruiter can come in and type in any arbitrarily complex query and immediately see in real time the supply and demand within the market. They can see the trends over time, they can see how job seekers break down in terms of demographics, really any question you would want to answer related to the market so supply and demand in the employment market, uh, you can answer with this tool. Uh, we search you know, for companies, we uh, power our compensation products, so if you come to Career Builder and you're trying to figure out you know, what you should be priced at, you can, again, put in any arbitrary query, type in any combination of skills, job titles, experiences, and, and see what the people who are most like you are, are making uh, today or in the future. You know, kind of projecting out. Uh, we have social search as well, so uh, you know, resumes and profiles scraped from across the web, um, in addition to the resumes that we have. And you know, just lots of other you know, mobile, lots of other various things, you know, more analytics. Um, all, all of this is powered off of our search platform. Uh, and to give you guys an idea of the scale that we operate at, uh, we typically get about 100 million searches a day across one and a half billion documents. Uh, we have about 500 search servers powering our platform. Uh, we've got 30 engineers on our uh, search team, uh, composed comprising uh, engineers focused on many different products, um, including our core infrastructure and core search platform, our relative recommendations team, and the job search team, and the candidate search team. Um, all together, it's uh, 30 software developers, data scientists, and data analysts. Uh, and then we, we uh, do all this to power one global search platform, powering, like I mentioned earlier, about 90% of our products. So we're a software as a service company predominantly. Um, and so all the things you see over here on the left are software products we sell to companies to help them with their recruitment process. And then on the right, you see our consumer-focused products. These are websites that job seekers come to looking for jobs. And you know, on any given day, we match you know, roughly a million people to jobs. So we, we get you know, roughly a million job applications coming in. So that's, all, that's the career builder. Uh, I'm going to switch now into talking a little bit about my philosophy on search and, and how I kind of see things intersecting and overlapping. And one thing I want to say first is, uh, one thing I mentioned earlier is that uh, we don't separate our recommendation engine from our search engine, and that's very intentional. And the reason is I actually see search and recommendations as on two ends of a continuum. On the one hand, you've got an, a search that's entered manually by a, a user, and uh, that might be a keyword, it might be a location, some combination, even more advanced than that. But the expectation typically is when you type a search in, uh, you're gonna match exactly what the user told you. So you're letting them completely drive the experience. They come back to the page again, the next time they run a search, they have to do it all over again. It's a, a very manual process because you're uh, leaving the user entirely in control. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you have recommendations. Recommendations are automatically giving the user something without them lifting a finger. And most of the time when you see recommendations on the page, you don't actually give the user the ability to add keywords and change the location, all these kinds of things. You just show them a list um, because the idea of recommendations is you don't want to make the user lift a finger. You want to be able to do it for them. And so a lot of re-engagement emails, if your company has those, are typically driven off of recommendations because in the context of sending the user an email, you can't ask them what content they want right now because you're not, they're not in front of you right now. But on the two ends of that continuum, uh, there's actually a lot of space in between that often goes neglected by those of us in information retrieval. So for example, if you have, like, take Career Builder. If someone comes to our website, and we know they're a job developer, they come to our search UI, and they type in uh, San Francisco. Why would we show them a random job in San Francisco? Why would we show them a registered nurse job or a sales job? It's, it doesn't make sense for us to do that if you've got context about the user and we could actually just move things up in the list higher that we know are related to, you know, if they're a software engineer, software engineering. On the flip side, if someone that we know is in Atlanta from their IP address or from a profile that we have types in job developer, why would we show them random job developer jobs? Why not try to show them things that are more likely going to be interesting to them that are closer to them? So that's, those are some examples where if you take search and you take recommendations, and you, you stop thinking of them as two entirely separate systems, where you can actually find a lot of interesting places in the middle where you can provide personalized search, not just search, not just recommendations, but some hybrid. 
And so this is the general diagram as I draw it um, between three sort of areas that we tend to think about. The top left, the blue, is traditional keyword search. So if you download Solar, download Elasticsearch, you, you know, build something on Lucene or your own proprietary thing, um, it's going to function in a very uh, predictable way if you're just doing basic keyword search. I mean, you take some text in, you tokenize it, and after you've tokenized it, you look up those terms against an inverted index on a case by on a term by term basis, and you're going to have um, you know decent matching. And if you use the default Lucene uh, similarity, if you use BM25, you're going to get pretty good results. But there's a lot to be desired because you really don't understand the intent of what these are typed in. You're just doing a bunch of uh, you're just running a bunch of scoring algorithms and, and tokenization algorithms on text. You don't really understand what's going on. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, I talked about a minute ago with recommendations. Uh, you, know, you can do full-blown recommendations, or if you do some of the things I just described, you've got this idea of personalized search, which is that continuum in between. Um, on the bottom, the, the bottom circle here, uh, which is the white circle, uh, I have semantic search. And at least in the context of career builder, semantic search has a very specific meaning, which is when the user types something in the keyword box, understanding what it is they're searching for. It, you know, if they type in senior Java developer, understanding that you know senior indicates the level of the job, and Java develop, developer is a phrase as part of that title. Uh, understanding that allows us to turn around and run the best query internally to really model the intent of the user instead of just searching for senior and Java and developer, which is what you'll get with traditional keyword search. And so our goal is really to be in the center here where we have the personalization and context of the user. We have we let the user drive the search by typing in keywords and locations, but also we've got this really intelligent semantic knowledge base that we can apply and use to take in the user's query and really parse it, disambiguate it, and, and understand what it's intending to express. So you'll see some of those themes come up throughout the rest of the talk. So going to traditional search, the top left circle. This is what you guys are probably used to if you use Lucene or Solar or Elasticsearch as your default scoring algorithm. If you're not familiar with this, you can look it up. It's you know widely publicized. I'm not going to spend time on it tonight. Uh, you know, BM25 is actually the new default in trunk of uh, Lucene um, and Solar. I'm not sure where Elasticsearch is on that right now, but I'm sure it'll become the default there as well. And this works very well for most searches that you would run. However, the big problem that this has that um, you can overcome to make your search much better is that it doesn't have any notion of domain. So if you're in the job search domain, there's things that we know about search, people searching for jobs. For example, how sensitive a job seeker is to location. You know, is the distance very important to them or is it not important? In some cases, for example, we know that food service workers are really, really highly sensitive to location. Our data scientists have found that uh, at the 95th percentile, food service workers are only applying to jobs that are 20 miles away. Whereas a software engineer at the 50th percentile is applying to jobs that are 500 miles away. What that means is that software engineers are willing to move you know, halfway across the country for the right job. Whereas a food service worker, you know, if someone's working at McDonald's or even a nice restaurant, they're not going to be moving their family to get another job. They're going to find one close to home. And so those are the kinds of things that within our domain we can use to better model relevancy. And it's not this keyword-based relevancy. It's, it's something a little bit more intelligent. And so here's some more examples. I mentioned uh, job search, where you know, the category of the job, the salary range, and geographical proximity really matter. If you look at new search, then popularity and freshness are going to be some of the key things driving relevancy. If you look at a restaurant search engine, geographical proximity is going to be king, and then maybe price range. If you look at e-commerce, likelihood of a purchase is key. I'm sure there's you know dozens of other things, maybe even hundreds of things that go into eBay's algorithm, but you know um, you, you want people to, to purchase. Uh, in movie search, popular titles are probably going to be more relevant than non-popular titles, even if they are the exact same title, I mean if the text is exactly the same. So there's all these kinds of things that, as you get more and more sophisticated uh, in your implementation of search, you're going to start gravitating to and away from this sort of base algorithmic relevancy model and towards a really domain-specific model where you understand what your users care about in aggregate and you model that in um, as your relevancy algorithm. So you know, 
compared to these kind of domain relevancy features, you know, TF-IDF can't, can't help but handle too. So, you know, here's, here's an example where for the news website on the previous slide, if I wanted to model this as, as a, a relevant query going into solar, I would model it something like this, where I would say, you know, I want to take my original query and make that 25% of the weight. Then I want to take in the geographical distance, how you know, far away from, um, how far away from me this article, like the place this article is about, how far away is it? Uh, then I want to take the publication date because you know, for a news article, the fresher it is, the better it is, generally speaking. And I want to take the popularity. Is it something a lot of people have read and liked? And so you, you can model that in, and that will basically, you know, I still have the TF-IDF there for my original query, and I'm still doing the filtering on it. But I can, uh, I can then uh, use these other factors to boost things up to the top and get more relevant news. Uh, Results. Similarly, in the job search domain, uh, I might say that you know keywords are 50% of my relevancy, distance is going to be 25%, and the categories are going to be 25%. And maybe based upon my users, I'll actually move these numbers up and down. If I know I'm looking at a food service worker, for example, like we mentioned earlier, I might move the distance way higher. If I'm looking at if I'm uh, running a search for a software engineer, then I would move the distance weight lower. And there's all, all those kind of factors that we can learn. If any of you guys are doing learning to rank, you can actually leverage learning to rank to build uh, keyword or category specific algorithms and, and really build an intelligent scoring system that way. So that's, those are some of the ideas that you come across when you're talking about basic relevancy. Meaning tr traditional search is TF-IDF plus the domain specific things that we were talking about just then. Uh, the other two categories I mentioned are personalization and then semantic search. So let's move from the blue circle that was on the original slide now to the orange circle, which was the recommendation circle. And let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that can be done there. So let's say that I have these four people. I've got John, he's a guy in Boston who wants to live to New York or possibly another big city. He's currently a sales manager but wants to move towards business development. This is an example of a reasonable, pro reasonable profile that we can build at Career Builder based upon a job seeker and what they've told us and the, the behaviors they've taken on our site for us to be able to aggregate these together and learn, learn something like this. Uh, another example is Irene, who's a bartender in Dublin. She's interested in jobs within 10 kilometers of her location in the food service industry. We can learn those from her, from her behavior or we can just ask that for user profile. Uh, Irfan, software engineer in Atlanta, interested in, in working for a big data company in software engineering. Or Jane, a nurse educator in Boston, seeking between $40,000 and $60,000 as a salary. So this is actually, I'm going to take Jane and use her as an example. Um, this is an example from Solar in Action. If you've got a copy or you know, get a copy, um, there's code examples for this as well, um, as well as some jobs that you can play with. But if I take Jane and turn her from a profile into a query, then again, Solar would look something like this. You know, I'm going to query on the job title uh, for nurse educator, which is what she is and what she's looking for. Um, if this is an exact match, I'm going to give it a higher boost. If it's a not not as good of a match, I'm going to give it a lower boost. Uh, if you know, at least I match both of the keywords, so that's a little bit fuzzier. And then you know, I'm going to look in Boston, and if she's in, if I can find a job in Boston for her, I'm going to give it a high boost. But really, if it's in Massachusetts somewhere. She might be willing to you know, relocate or move for us. I'm gonna I'm gonna include those as well, so I might get nearby places. And then uh, you know I, she really wants to be between forty thousand and sixty thousand dollars for her salary, so let me set that set that into the range and then boost results higher that are that, that match that part of the query as well. And so if you take this and run this as a query, and I'm you know gonna caveat with saying this is a really basic query. I mean, if you were doing this in production, I would recommend using you know, some geospatial capabilities as opposed to just searching on you know, cities and states as text. But you get the general idea of what we're doing. If I take that, run it against the search engine that's populated with a handful of jobs, these are, these are examples of what come back. So I see you know, Jane was a nurse educator. She wants to be in Boston between $40,000 and $60,000. This first one is a clinical educator in Boston <coughs> making between forty and $60,000. The next one is a nurse educator. I don't know where Braintree is, but uh, you know it's in Massachusetts, and it's making between. Is it close to Boston? I don't know. It, okay, there you go. It's close to Boston. <laughs> <laughs> um, making you know fifty-six thousand dollars. That's still in her range. And then the last one is a nurse educator in Brighton, 
making over $60,000. She's probably okay with that, but she probably also won't get that job. Uh, and you know, there's a very limited subset of data that went into, went into this example, and you can download all the data there if you want to fire this up and run it. But the main point here is that instead of having this be a user-entered search, where the search engine is used for Jane to come in and type in all of her things, run a search once, and then leave, instead we've collected all this information about Jane, we've aggregated it into a profile, and now we can turn around and just run it as a search to generate recommendations for Jane. And so that's you know exactly what we did. We built a recommendation engine just leveraging uh, the, the core search engine and modeling queries in to represent our users. And so I don't know what the academic definition of a recommendation is, the recommendation engine is, but Trey's definition of a recommendation engine is a system that uses known information or derived information from that known information to automatically suggest relevant content. So you could build some complex matrix factorization in, um, in Hadoop or Spark that, uh, you know, does matrix, uh, does matrix multiplication and generates a nice list of recommendations. Or you could say, I know Jane is a nurse, so I'm going to search for the keyword of nurse and, recommend, and show some content to Jane. You know, both of those are recommendations. And I would even argue that when Jane comes to the website and types in nurse, that you're giving her recommendations back as well. You're, you're matching. Whether it's search or whether it's a recommendation engine, it's the concept of matching and trying to get the user what they're looking for. Yeah? Yeah, I agree with the uh, concept of recommendation engine, but it seems like you're building this user profile for using just one uh, episode of that user query, right? I mean, the user profile that you're building is based on one search that goes in there that she's a nurse educator involved in. No, 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 sorry. Um, th these are supposed to be representative of all of the information we know about the user. So they might have run 20 searches and we've learned from those searches that, that she is searching for jobs that are between $40,000 dollars, $40, and $60,000 on average. Um, she's look, either, she either has a nurse educator job based upon a resume or she continues to search for nurse educator jobs over and over. So this, this isn't meant to be a search, this is meant to be a user profile. Right, what I'm saying was like, I don't know if statistically you can say that 20 episodes over a historical period are sufficient to represent that user profile. Right. Well, th there's two ways to get a user profile. One is you ask the user, hey, please fill all these things in for me and tell me what you want. The other way is if you've got sufficient information about the user and sufficient activity, you can derive a profile from that. Um, but you know, for the purposes of this discussion, um, you know, assume we did either one here. Um, this is just showing the example that if you have information about a user, you can leverage it to recommend things for them automatically without making them run a search. So, they did. Okay. And so, uh, so I mentioned this is you know a basic recommendation engine where our example uh, was on attributes. So we built an attribute based recommendation engine, but you can also leverage. Uh, Lucene to do, or really any inverted index to do searches on um, any kind of behavioral data as well. So you can do collaborative filtering very easily, le uh, leveraging Lucene. And we, you, know, you have a document, say in our case, jobs. On the job, you add a field that is users who applied to this job. And then whenever you go to run searches, you can find the users who applied to any given job, search for those users, and then find other jobs that those, those users apply to. You, you basically do the entire collaborative filtering problem. Um, you do a, um, basically a vector by matrix multiplication instead of an entire matrix by matrix multiplication. But you know whether you're doing attributes or whether you're doing behaviors or really anything that you can tag you know, a user in a document with, you can leverage as features uh, to do you know, search and recommendation and personalization. Yep. Uh, in that, uh, for each word, you give the uniform weight, right? There is no any separate weight. On the words, words you have for Jane, right? All all words are of equal importance. So how exactly you relax it to get seventy-one thousand salary, although you had forty to sixty thousand salary in the in the prior example? How did you end up with the last data in the search? That's what I was curious. How, how did they show up in this order? Uh, no, no, seventy-one thousand. Your range was only up to sixty thousand, right? right? Okay, yeah. So the answer is these aren't filters. Okay, okay. Uh, so like in, in this last case. Um, well, I'm doing a, a function okay. here, and it's basically just applying boost. So if you, in Lucene, if you and um, a function, um, it actually matches all documents, and so it just applies a relevancy boost. 
Okay. So it's not a filter. It's a if I happen to match this, then make the uh, relative weighting higher. Okay. That's why. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's, you know, same thing in here. I searched for Boston, Massachusetts, and just Massachusetts by itself. But because I ordered them together, they'll all, they'll all match. Uh, so I'm not going to spend time on it tonight. If you guys want to ask at the end, I've got a few slides, I think, at the end, um, specifically about how to do collaborative filtering in solar, but uh, I'm going to skip over that for now. If you do want to have a really good walkthrough of that, I gave a talk um, in Boston a few years back that goes in detail about building a recommendation on top of solar, so uh, feel free to check that out. And I, I can answer questions about it later as well. And so we talked about recommendations. We talked about talked about traditional search um, and this idea of personalization. I really want to drive home that that area in between, because you know why would you limit yourself when a user's searching? Um, like I said earlier, if a soft, if you know someone's a software engineer and they run a blank job search in New York, why not show them software engineering results higher? And if they uh, run a keyword search for nurse um, and you have their IP address, why not boost documents that are geographically closer? So these are some of the things you can think about in terms of trying to fill that uh, space in between recommendations and, and search. And so now I want to move on to that last circle, which was the, the white circle, which is semantic search. And so for us, this is the circle where we really try to understand our domain. And we bring that domain expertise, and we try to understand the intent of the user. So I'm going to spend the rest of the talk focused on this and really trying to dig, dig deep into the, the problem. And I've even got some examples. I'll show you guys um, so some live examples we can walk through. So before we dive into the technical details, I just want to talk about the problem we're trying to solve. Specifically, take this query. Machine learning, research and development, Portland, uh, Oregon, software engineer, and to do Java. This is not an unrealistic query that someone might type into our system at Career Builder, say a recruiter looking for a job seeker. It's not well formed. You would, you would hope that they would be a little bit more knowledgeable about Boolean and what that means, but you can't expect all of your users to, to be that, um, in, I don't want to say intelligent, you can't expect all of your users to be that sophisticated. Uh, and also, for many different products, especially the ones you guys have, you probably don't expect your users to type Boolean at all. You just expect them to throw whatever they want in the engine. You just need to understand it. And so, can, can someone tell me, you know, if you pass this to Solar or Lucene or Elasticsearch, what, what's it, how's it going to parse this? Basically, seen out of the box, what's it going to do? And that all will get uh, just like into some modifier or like mm -hmm. operator. Yep. So let's and say your default will... operator is and. Yeah. Oh, okay. The other will be just a type of one. Yep. So something kind of like this, right? So machine and learning and research and development and Portland. Oh, or is actually a Boolean operator in this case. So software and engineer and Hadoop and Java. Uh, you know, you might get decent results at the top because the relevancy ranking saves your high, but this is not at all what the user intended when they express that query. So how can we make this better? When you or I look at this query, we, we parse it mentally, and we, we know what the individual words and phrases are, but the search engine can't do that natively because it doesn't have that context. It hasn't learned all these phrases and doesn't know what they mean. But if we could parse it to be something like this, machine learning and research and development and Portland, Oregon and software engineer and Hadoop and Java, then I think we're well on our way to really understanding what the user intended and being able to model that back to the search engine. To go one step further, though, if we actually not just understand them as text, but if we parse them out as entities that we understand, we can actually re-express the query in a better way to be able to uh, run a much more intelligent search. So in this case, I know that machine learning is related to data scientists or data mining and artificial intelligence. I know that R&D is a synonym for research and development, is an acronym for it. I know that Portland, Oregon is the location, so I can also apply a geo filter on top of it so that I can you know, search it for anything within 50 kilometers. I know uh, software developers, another form of software engineer, and I know that big data, HBase, Hive, um, all those things are related to Hadoop. So you, you could express it back to the search engine like this. And that's not even to say this is the best way to model this to get the most relevant results, but it's going in the right direction. And you know, once we're able to do something like this, we can really kind of re restructure the query and um, you know, do some machine learning algorithms to really figure out the best structure but if I express the query like this, I'm searching a much more on the meaning of what the user typed in as opposed to 
the text and you know more than just even the phrases. And so I'm going to walk through how we do this. Yep. I have a question about your query rewrites, about sure. your research and development R and D and software development software too. So do you get those from mining your logs? We do. Yep. I'm going to I'll, I'll walk through what we do actually. It's like two slides ahead, I think. Um, so, uh, and you know, in addition to just parsing this out as phrases and uh, you know expanding it out, uh, it's also important to know that we want to search on things, not strengths. So, in this case, when I I might parse it out as senior Hadoop developer at Google, but what I really want to know is that senior is a job level designator, Hadoop developer is a job title, and Google is a company, or that you know strategy consultant McKinsey Harvard MBA, that Harvard MBA is a school and degree combination, and that McKinsey is a company and strategy consultant is some form of a job title. Yep. Is there any sort of weighting difference depending on what they have first? You know, you had 10s for all those, but would it be better 10, 9, 8, something like that, where it falls off the... Uh... <coughs> yes. Yeah, it, what would honestly be better is uh, to understand, you know, when we go to this level, when we understand you know, skills and job titles and companies, to understand that when someone types a company name in, that that should really take precedence over any of the, the skills. For example, if you type in Microsoft versus Microsoft Visual Studio, um, or you know Google versus well, I don't use this example, but you know depending upon what you type in and the combination of those things, you actually may want to supply um, significantly different weights. And e even more than that, you might want some things to be filters as opposed to boosts. So there, there's a lot more sophistication that can go in there. Uh, this is just kind of a crude example. So is that something that can be learned, or is that something you've, you've coded? Um, it is something that we've coded in and, are, and are in the process of learning. Okay. You mean? I assume you mean machine learning when okay. I say learn. Yeah. So that's the direction we want to go. To do that, what we've built is what I what I call an intent engine. And so you know, if you think of this as the different steps throughout the user flow, uh, the search box, every green box is a point at which we interact with the user. So the, the search box at the top, that's where you start with the user. They type in a keyword or location or some other filter. We take that. We have type ahead prediction, also known as autocomplete. As the user's typing, we're trying to show them what we think they mean and let them you know, select that as the meaning or override us. Uh, we also, as I showed you a few minutes ago, have this concept of semantic query parsing. So when you type in senior Hadoop developer Google, we parse that out into senior Hadoop developers a phrase and then Google as a company. That's the semantic query parsing piece. Uh, it's important that we, ha we identify those entities and have entity type recognition so we understand what you know, skills and job titles and companies are. Uh, and it's also important that we have contextual disambiguation. So um, you know, commonly in our domain, for example, um, if someone types uh, the word server, somebody tell me what the word server means. Restaurant? I'm, I'm surprised someone in this room came up with that one. <laughs> it's it's you know a, a device which software runs on, or it's a person working in a restaurant. How do you, how do you know which one of those is right? What about driver? What's a driver? <laughs> What's that? What's engine? Yeah, yeah, engine. You know, a driver. You know, if someone types in Linux, C plus plus, and driver. It means something very different than if someone types in CDL, truck, and driver. So you know, there, there's a lot of cases where we have to you know, take our best guess or take some context into consideration to, to disambiguate the meaning of what they're typing in. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of that and how we do it. Um, and then obviously, you know, spell correction is a no-brainer. I think everybody here does that. And then uh, query augmentation is another piece where, uh, like on the previous slide, we you know, take the original query, we augment it, and try to include all these other pieces of information. And then uh, finally, we go into this rewriting and uh, ranking piece, where we actually try to take all these characteristics that we now understand about the intent of the user and model them back as a query uh, to the engine to get the most relevant results. So I'm going to walk through some of these sections. So first of all is type ahead predictions, also known as autocomplete. Uh, what we've implemented, implemented at Career Builder has a few interesting characteristics. Uh, so we, we don't just have a flat list, we actually autocomplete based upon entity type. So as I type in um, oncology, OOCO, you see that you know, I've got 
you know, it can search for that as full text. I understand that an oncologist is a job title. I understand that oncology is a skill, and then I've got a couple of other skills as well that show up there. Um, so we break them out by the category. We also understand abbreviations, alternate forms, and misspellings. And so one, you know, interesting thing that goes into our autocomplete engine is we don't. We, we build out this master list of surface to canonical mappings, meaning chief technology officer is a surface form that maps the chief technology officer as a canonical, but also CTO is a surface form that maps the chief technology officer. So no matter which one you type into our search engine, we're going to understand it as the same. I don't have trouble with the demos, aren't I? We'll try that later. You can put the mic off of the other one. I might do that in a bit. Uh, how do you deal with these? Different types of entities. It's like do you use a different core for job titles and different types of skills, and how do you know it's your core? So we, uh, I mean, the way we do it, we use Solar. We uh, send a search to Solar. Um, we, so think of this: way. we have all of our entities that we would autocomplete on in uh, Solar Index. We uh, have a field in there that basically does um, bigram analysis. So you know, all the different bigrams go in there. Um, to, to match the word, and then uh, and by bigram I'm referring to the um, within a word bigrams, not the multiple word bigrams. Uh, and then whenever you run the search, we basically, whenever someone types, you know, O-N-C, we pass that to the solar index. It searches on everything that has, that starts with O-N-C, and then matches, and then we basically group. So we, you know, say now take, we have entity type as a field, we group on that field, and that allows us to bring all the different entity types back. So job title, skill, company, et cetera. And then it all comes back in one call, and that's our obviously guest list. I like it. And it's ranked by popularity. Ranked by popularity. Uh, specifically, uh, we get all of this information from our query logs. So an, a, an important part of our process is take all of our query logs, mine them, figure out what searched the most, what other things are searched with those things to get a list of related keywords. And uh, we use the list of related keywords um, as part of the semantic boosting, like the, the expansion I showed you a minute ago. Um, and also, we use it for disambiguation, which I'll show you in just a bit. So, just to follow up, you, you put an individual word boost uh, corresponding to its popularity on the fields in, in that index? We do. So, for autocomplete specifically, we do. And for autocomplete specifically, we sort on that popularity. So, if you type in um, O and C, ev everything you see on here is sorted. Well, the categories. Um, could move around if we wanted them to based upon popularity, but we keep them static because it's it's confusing for our users if everything's jumping around. But you know, within the skills where you see four of them, they are ordered based upon the popularity of those skills. Yeah. How is the latency? Fast? A millisecond? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so there, there's a couple of different ways to do autocomplete. Um, we, you know, one of them is just to have a static autocomplete index. So you build, you can build our taxonomy and have that static index. The other is within your actual document set to do autocomplete based upon that, where you get real numbers and real data to show on. So this example I'm showing you here is a static index, which is basically our taxonomy that we have learned from mining our query logs. Uh, however, uh, you know, depending upon the user experience you're talking about, you might actually do both forms of autocomplete and combine them together. So like for example, if you want to autocomplete on the name field, if I have people you know, in a resume database, then uh, you know, I'm not going to pre-build a list of all the names. I'm going to, you know, for every customer where they might have unique resumes, I'm going to actually get the indexes. So we, we would combine the two together. Uh, and then the other, a couple other interesting things about the autocomplete, and I'll show you guys in uh, demo at the end. Uh, one is we support full Boolean syntax in here. So, uh, you know, as I'm typing, you know, if, if there's ands or ors, it will actually pull those out. And also, it's per word autocomplete. So, you know, as soon as I finish typing oncology and move on to the next word, the autocomplete box pops up again. And it can actually take the context of all the words I've typed already in when it's going to autocomplete the next thing. So that, uh, you know, for example, my driver example earlier, if I type in C++ and then driver, it's going to have a you know different meaning and understanding of what it is. Um, and so there's a couple of nuances there. And then, uh, you know, you can also do fielded search. So if I'm going to type in job title colon and then a value, I can type that in. So it's, a lot of it's just UI magic. It's not really core search magic. 
but uh, you know, in terms of the semantic parsing of what comes in, that, that does leverage our semantic search technology. <coughs> I, I yep. thought, so you, you keep mentioning uh, this uh, name entity recognition that you perform before you run the query on solar, but how, how do you actually, without going to solar first, you do this name entity recognition? Are you something like opening OP or just regular expressions and huge? I'll come back to that in five minutes. I've got a five for it. And if I don't answer your question, you know, ask me again. Okay. <laughs> uh, spelling correction, uh, a couple of nuances here. I mentioned earlier that the way we derive our taxonomy I just showed you is from our query logs. Uh, and what we do is we find all the terms, we find all the other things that are searched with those terms, and then we build effectively this term vector associated with every term you would type in. Uh, because we're doing that, one thing we pick up automatically from our query logs is misspellings. So for example, if you come to our complete and you type manger, then you know, we don't have any job for mangers or people selling mangers or people you know, wanting to buy mangers. You know, that, that's not a thing um, in you know, searching for jobs. Um, but usually it's a misspelling for manager. So most people will type in manger, then they'll say, oh, I didn't get the results I wanted. They'll turn around and search for manager and they'll get the results they wanted. So um, you same thing, registered nurse, you know, pretty much any common misspelling, we're going to automatically find and map that as a surface form to the official canonical form. So one nice thing about uh, spell correction here is as you're typing, the autocomplete list basically just you know pretends like you know you didn't type names or you typed manager and just automatically completes for you. If you want to override it, you can, but it's sort of built in and very nuanced where the, the user doesn't really even know you did it. So instead of them typing something and you saying, hey, did you mean this? Or, hey, we automatically corrected your query. You know, we just do it for them in the box. And if it really meant major and we fixed it, they're going to fix the autocorrect. But it, it's very nuanced. And, and nine, nine times out of 10, probably 99 times out of 100, it actually does the right thing. Uh, OK. Anything? Yep. Yeah, spelling correction, how much are you using the solar or the solar? We're, we're not now. Um, because we've put this semantic um, layer on top of solar. Uh, whenever someone types in a misspelling, we automatically map it to the canonical. So we actually don't have a need natively to use the solar spell corrector. Um, there are some cases where it would help us for things that we missed today. So we're, we're going to leverage it or you know, something deeper in the scene in the future. But uh, the answer is no, we're not using it today. Because if you use two different layers, if you both of them enable, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, core to our approach. I'll keep saying this over and over again. But core to our approach is mining of our query logs and taking the actual searches that people are running in our domain and using them as the basis for a lot of what we do. So instead of using more algorithmic-based uh, capabilities that would be, you know, deep down in Lucene or Solar, they're, you know, looking at TF and IDF and the index and trying to make some guesses based upon number of occurrences. We uh, we will leverage our query logs as much as possible when we can. And that works well when you have, you know, 100 million queries a day. That doesn't work as well when you have, you know, five queries a day. So depending upon, you know, if you're a startup and you're, you know, you have no users yet, you have to take an entirely different approach, um, but maybe hopefully you'll get to that point some, someday. <laughs> we, a lot of the, the important spell corrections actually Users will search with a misspelling already, but yeah, we do we do edit this stuff that's only points for everything else. Like you know, for um, for example, for um, acronym detection, CTO, the Chief Technology Officer, will do something that checks the first letter of everything and tries to see if you know it's it, we, we do some stuff like that. All right, so two entity type and entity type resolution. So there's a couple of categories of um, related terms that we care about. I mentioned to you that we. Uh, minor query logs, we find queries, and then we get a list, a vector of other terms that are related to the original term. There's a couple of interesting nuances. Uh, for example, synonyms. So CPA maps a certified public accountant. RN maps a registered nurse. R dot N maps a registered nurse. Um, also, we have ambiguous terms, like we mentioned, driver. So 80% of the time, that's referring to a truck driver. The other, and 20% of the time, that's referring to some some software system driver. Um, but depending upon the context, it, it means different. And then synonyms and biggest terms, the other categories are related terms. So nursing and Bachelor of Science in Nursing are related to RN, and MacReduce, Hive, and Pig are related to Hadoop, but they're not the same thing. 
We want to be able to leverage the knowledge of the relationship while not assuming that it's, that it's the same thing. So we've got um, three different research papers on this topic specifically that we've published in the last uh, year. Um, the most important one out of the three, I would say, is this, this one on top. It's called Crowdsource Query Augmentation Through the Semantic Discovery of Domain-Specific Jargon. Uh, the general idea there is that we mine our query logs, we find terms and phrases in those query logs without having to do any NLP on them. They just are the phrase. And then we um, you know, find the other related phrases to go along with them. Um, the nice thing about that approach is we can learn all of these relationships and we learn basically a taxonomy of terms and what they're related to and you know, synonyms, acronyms, without having to really use any NLP techniques whatsoever, which means this, this technique scales to every language that we support, even Chinese, you know, because we're not really splitting a white space, we're taking the phrase as, as is, as it comes in to the search engine and leveraging it. So it's a nice way to bypass a lot of the downsides of leveraging common NLP libraries where they only support one or two or three languages. It allows us to apply this universally. Um, and there are a lot of ways to build a taxonomy of entities. Um, what we do, like I mentioned, is the uh, query log mining. Uh, you could also do topic modeling, you could cluster documents together to try to find common phrases that um, you know, occur uh, within your content. Uh, you can do statistical analysis of interesting phrases, or you can buy a dictionary, um, assuming you don't have some you know, domain-specific use case, which almost everybody in this room has. Um, but, you know, that's the option people usually start with. Um, the other two papers, what were they? Um, and the quality of the links, and then query census integration. We'll talk about that. So two entity types. So your, your question, ask me your question again. So before going to Solar, uh, if you're doing the type ahead and you have all these different types of entities, how do you figure out which entity you're talking about if you do NLP? So my question was if we were using any NLP to figure out the same entity map. To find the entities, we're not. We're just mining the query logs. So, user search for you know, a hundred thousand things. We mine the query logs, find those hundred thousand things, set a statistical threshold, um, do some. Um, one of the uh, one of the papers here was about basically cleaning up those that list of entities because it is entirely mined from our query logs. There's a lot of noise in there, so we basically go the route of to take everything that is popularly searched for and then remove noise. For example, bots are a big problem for us. We'll have a bot that will run the same search 100,000 times on our website for Viagra. <laughs> or you know, some alternate spelling of Viagra. Um, and so things like that become a problem for us. And so one easy way to fix that is mind the query logs after you've found all these terms. You know, for example, say I've got you know, Java, and it's the people who search for Java also search for um, J2EE, um, JSP, and Viagra. Okay, how are we going to fix that? Well, one easy way to do, do it is just look at our content. So let me just send a query to the search engine for Java and J2EE. I found a bunch of documents. Okay, well that's a good relationship. Let me search for Java and JSP. That's a good relationship. Let me search for Java and Viagra. Hey, we actually have zero documents that have the word Viagra in them. Okay, well that's probably a good indication that that was a bad relationship. It was caused by a lot, therefore we throw that out of the query logs. There, there's some kind of basic things you can do like that. There's also some more sophisticated statistical techniques that you can apply. So when you log your query, um, do you also log the question? So how do you deal with that? So we, all the queries are log in session, meaning the same user runs you know, query one, query two, query three. So query one is manager, query two is manager, query three is software development manager. Because the, the user, when they see their first search, they know it's wrong, they fix it. They see their second search, they know it's too general, so then they make it more specific. So we can, you know, you can track from search to search, um, you know, how the queries are progressing. When you're doing the library, you have to use this kind of Yep. So you're taking manager and manager, how do you basically, so do you, do you capture both? Or do you capture the list this spell and then as you connect to the yeah, so we, we, we have the luxury that some of our search interfaces today, most of them actually, don't leverage the semantic autocomplete yet. Um, therefore, we still have misspellings. But as soon as we correct them, then that's going to be a problem, right? You know, if you 
if your system is automatically correcting the thing that it used to train the correction, then you're not going to be able to do that in the future. So yeah, that's that's you know something we'll have to work around. Uh, another quick question on the same naming recognition. So, but how do you deal with locations, for example? Uh, I'm sure users don't train you with these small towns' names, or do they? How do you know that's a town? Yeah, locations are. You, you just get a dictionary of all the locations oh. in the world. That, that's the short answer. Our, um, <laughs> so this slide, we so what we did is we actually built classifiers to classify all the different entity types. So, um, you know, scale, location, you know, job title, all of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, to train the location classifier, we pass it in a list of all the locations in the world, and it figures out what a location looks like. Um, you know, even something like Eiffel Tower would you know, be considered, but that one might not match as well as something that had a city and state. Um, in skills versus job types, we take a list of skills and a list of job types we found, and we train the classifier. Um, and, and the one we train is about 97% accurate. It's not perfect, but it, it works pretty well at figuring out which entity type you're talking about. And if something's in a taxonomy that we built separately, we would automatically include that as a site. Um, yeah, location's a hard one, especially because we actually still have a keyword box and a location box, like most people do. Um, and so our users don't commonly put locations in the keyword box. But we want to move to a world where we just have one box and we can parse it out. And so um, that's a problem for future years, <laughs> not for, for today. For us, at least. A lot of you have solved, I'm sure. Yeah? So, where do you get the uh, metadata for classifiers? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. So, where do you get the metadata for classifiers? So, the question is where do we get the metadata for classifying? For, in this case, you know, registered nurse um, or any of these other ones. Uh, we basically we have a trained data set. Um, we, like for locations, we um, use our geolocation provider and get a list of locations from them, and then those go into train the location classifier. For skills, we have a skills taxonomy that we pass in uh, to uh, leverage for the basis of classification. Same thing for job types. We have three existing taxonomies that we use. If we didn't, we would have an analyst go through an annotate. So every search goes through all the classifiers, or how is um, no. Uh, think, think of it this way. We, we build our entire system to be, uh, let's go describe it. We build our entire system to be able to have everything discovered on it dynamically. Meaning if you pass me a keyword that I've never seen before, I'm going to run through all of my different services and figure out what it is. You know, what's its classification, what's it related to, uh, what, what, are the, what are the skills it's related to, all, all those kinds of things. However, for all of the entities that we've ever seen before, we run that analysis and cache it. So when you go to run a search for, for Java, I'm not hitting all these services because I already know what Java is because I've seen it before. So the first time around, you still have that lag? We, we have a batch process that runs offline, so the, the user never sees the lag. It, it always runs before the user would see it. The only time they would see the lag is if they type something that's way down the long tail that we've never seen before, in which case we would you know, have them with the lag that one time. Well, but but we mine our query logs to figure out what, what all the things people ever searched for were, and then the ones that are popular, we will pre-process this offline. So it's a cold start. You know, if we were you know day one startup, then yeah, we wouldn't have anything. But you know, with 100 million searches a day, you can do lots of that. So, so how, how do you do How would you fix it? Is that your question? Okay, so he has a cold start problem. He wants to know how to fix it. Um, uh, for which problem specifically? <coughs> sure, sure. Okay, sure. Um, actually, I have some slides at the end, but I don't want to sort through sort of them right now. Um, what I would do if I were starting out. Okay, 
if I were starting out from scratch and I didn't have query logs that I can mine, what I would do is I would um, do some form of clustering on my documents. So, uh, for example, let's say you search for .NET and you want to know what are the things that are related to .NET. Well, if you run a search for .NET, the most relevant results that came back, you know, the things that are showing up here are software engineer, um, developer, there's this thing called a C-sharp, so I don't know why a music note is related to .NET, but it is, so I'm going to include it. .NET developer, you know, th those are, you, you, if you do basic clustering, you can try to find relationships between things um, to, you know, be able to figure out, you know, what entities are, or, you know, given this entity, what, what are the things related to it. And then, you know, you know, in Solar, you basically just configure a, um, you know, request handler to do clustering, run a search, uh, just get them searching for Solar or Lucene, and um, you turn around and, you know, for that search, here's a bunch of things that came back um, that are related to that search. Um, you know, it's not a clean list, like when you mine your query log, it's also not a clean list, but it's at least more representative of what you would actually type in. Um, so, you know, developer, Java developer, senior Java developer, Java J2E, these kinds of things, solutions architect. Uh, we'll come back. Those, those are things that are just found by clustering your documents and saying these, these are uh, phrases that I could, I could find. Um, also, if you've got fields in your documents that are, you know, like in our case, we have a job title, maybe a skills field. There will be entities in those fields that the users gave you. And so if you basically aggregate those together and count the top ones, you can probably auto-generate a taxonomy pretty easily just from, from your underlying data. But if you don't have query logs, then you need to go to the documents themselves and try to mine something out of them. Uh, sorry, what's the question? Uh, yeah, so, so my query um, of Solar or Lucene, I basically said, given this query, I want to find things that are related to it, some entities that are related to it. So this is a way to automatically discover entities when you don't have the taxonomy. Um, you, you could also, uh, like I said, just, you know, if you've got in our case, a job title field, you can pass it on that and take the top job title and say, well, that's my, this is raw text, but these things show up very commonly, so this is going to be my job title taxonomy now. Anything that's above a certain popularity, I'm going to take it. Um, if you can. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, you had a question. You good? Great question. My next section is contextual disambiguation. <laughs> so let's go do that. We are five minutes ahead of all <laughs> uh, Okay, so we, we talked about the um, entity type stuff. Um, that's, anyway, we, we can answer more questions about that later. Um, to contextual disambiguation. So I mentioned that, I'm going to keep saying this over and over again. We minor query logs, we get terms, figure out what other terms are that are related to them. That works really, really well for most keywords because they're not ambiguous. However, what do you do in a case like this, where I've got driver or I've got architect? And the list of related terms that comes back for driver is truck driver, Linux, Windows, courier, embedded, CDL and delivery. For architect, it's AutoCAD drafter, designer, enterprise architect, Java architect, designer, data architect, Oracle. You know, there, there's clearly two different senses, sometimes more than two different senses, found within these relationships. The question is, how do we go about um, disambiguating them so that we know, you know, CPA in different contexts, what does it mean? The way we do that um, is a three-step process. The first is we classify users who ran each search. So, for example, um, users who ran CPA, well, I, I don't actually know the two meanings of CPA. Can you share those with me? Take a what, what, what are the two different meanings of CPA? Child placement agency. Okay. So different kinds of job seekers are going to be searching for job placement agency versus the one searching for a certified public. And so what we do is within our query logs, you know, every 
query is tied back to a user. We actually classify the users, and then we look at the related keywords within a given classification. Yeah, so in this case, um, uh, so all the users who are Java developers, um, you know, they search for Java. They search for J2AD. Um, .NET developers search for C-sharp. Um, people in healthcare search for RN. Nurses search for RN. So we basically build a uh, probabilistic graphical model that maps the category of the job seeker to the uh, keywords that they're searching. Uh, once we've classified the users and created that probabilistic graphical model, we then segment each search term to related search terms list by that classification. Um, and then that ultimately gets us, you know, say we have you know, a thousand different classifications, we end up with a thousand different keyword to list of related keyword pairs. Once we've done that, obviously, you know, a thousand different vector, term vectors are too many. So then we actually do similarity between the vectors. And what we find is that in almost all cases, the vectors are very, very similar across different categories, but in some cases you have outliers. So, uh, you know, the case of architect, you know, mo architect doesn't actually appear very commonly in most of our job categories, but it appears very heavily in, you know, building and um, in engineering kind of disciplines, and in software engineering, it has very, very specific other terms that occur in its term vector. And so when we actually divide it out into all the different user classifications, we're able to very cleanly divide that architect in the software engineer context has enterprise architect, Java architect, data architect, Oracle, Java, and .NET, whereas architect in the, um, I don't know, building. What, what's that? Building? The, build, the building context um, is architectural designer, architectural drafter, AutoCAD, AutoCAD drafter, designer, drafter, et cetera. Same thing with driver. We end up with one context, which is Linux, Windows, and Embedded, and another context, which is everything having to do with driving a truck. Designer. This one's particularly interesting. Um, we, we see a lot of cases where this shows us some nuance. And so uh, we, we actually get three different contexts here. The first one looks like a um, graphic artist, I guess. The second is a web designer. And the third is a, and it's more of an engineer drafter kind of context. So I, I don't, I could, I, I wish I would have included the categories that these came from here. But what you can see is that um, there, there's actually some similarities between them, but you do end up with these unique vectors associated with the context. And so this goes back to the personalization we were talking about earlier, where if I know who the user is and what context they're in, and they run a search for designer, I can pick a different vector associated with what they mean as opposed to just um, you know, any random job seeker. And what I do is if I don't have any context for the user or any context for the query, I will turn around and just use whatever the most popular one is. So in the case of driver, I know that 80% of the time it's a truck driver. So if I don't know anything about the user, I just use truck driver because I'm going to be right 80% of the time. Uh, you know, I can't be perfect and I can't guess things that weren't told to me about the user, but uh, that's, our, that's our general um, philosophy. So um, to rephrase that, um, in a situation where the user searches for an ambiguous phrase, uh, what information can we use to pick the correct underlying meaning? So for driver, um, if we've got any pre-existing knowledge for the user, for example, I know that the user is a software engineer, and that the, or that the user has previously run searches for things like C++ and Linux, then I can pick the top one. Um, if I have context within the query, I can also use that. So if, if the query itself is Windows and driver versus courier or driver, then you know, given the context of the surrounding keywords, I can use those to pick whichever the most similar uh, term vector is associated with the meaning. And finally, like I said, if we don't have any context, then we just fall back to the popular. Okay. How is the performance for this for a single workflow? They perform very well. So uh, keep in mind that we do we mine all the data offline and we cache it. So when someone um, types in driver, they, they type in a query, we parse out all the terms and phrases. And for each of those, we have a pre-existing uh, term vector or list of term vectors. It's like we actually don't have that many ambiguous terms and phrases in our domain. But you know, when we do find one, that's when we do the extra processing step of saying, all right, well, let me take the context in do a quick similarity map with the vector and then find the one that's the most relevant. Like if, if, if there's a driver, right? Uh, and you just have all these drivers, like how would you begin? Any, any, this kind of problem you have faced where you need to be able to see a single word for you, 
Yeah, so the question is, what do you do in the context where you just don't have context? Yeah, and it's just number three here. We just use the most popular one. If I, if I don't have anything that would tie me back to one of those term vectors, I just use the most popular driver, which in our case is trunk driver. Um, okay, so onto the semantic query parsing. So we, uh, we've already walked through the machine learning example um, earlier, and we've seen that you know, the traditional query parsing you get the search engine is not um, good enough. It doesn't really reflect the user's intent. And so to take that a step further, um, just to kind of drive the point home, you know, if I search for project manager, then that becomes project and manager. I search for building architect. So that, that'll match a, a job in our case for anybody who's ever managed um, and who's ever worked on a project, which is not a project manager. Um, building architect matches any document that has the word building and architect. Software architect is software and architect. Um, and so just consider that a software architect is someone who designs and builds software, and a building architect is someone who uses software to design architecture. And so the engine is going to be utterly confused. You know, if you type, you could type software building architect, and you would get results back because those words appear commonly across both domains. Uh, and I've, I've seen this as well, just using the, the basic search engine. So it's really, really important, not that we just understand what the individual words mean, mean but that we can actually parse out phrases because the sum of a phrase is worth uh, much more than the individual parts. And so the way this works, we, we have built a semantic query parser, which can basically take in a phrase like this, senior software engineer, Perl, do big data, and parse it out into the constituent phrases and then display them back to the user. Um, and then with the related terms and phrases that I talked with you guys about earlier, we can then actually expand out um, each of those terms to include a bunch of other related things that were found commonly uh, you know, searched for along with those. And then we can automatically expand the query behind the scenes for the user and you know, so select a good same list of defaults and allow the user to, um, you know, if they're a very basic user, they'll just see this view where we've parsed out the meaning of the phrases. But if they're a power user, they can actually dig down into um, what we've expanded things um, out to. And you think this is sort of a visual around a Boolean query um, that we've provided them and allow them to interact with it. Yeah? Um, what if uh, the user doesn't agree with your segmentation? Can they go to yeah. That? yeah, they can. Um, so, um, the common use case is that it's actually put a bunch of text in here and hit enter. The common use case is to interact with autocomplete. Um, and so when you interact with autocomplete and it parses things out for you, if you don't like it, you hit back. And you, you just say, well, no, you can put quotes around something, for example, to say, no, 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 that should be a phrase. Like there, there's, there's things in the autocomplete that allow you to override it. Um, you do have to take an extra action to override it because the assumption is that it's right. And um, we've benchmarked it and about um, 98 percent of the time for very simple queries we're right and for complex boolean queries about 92 percent of the time we're right so you know we're we're wrong often enough that we have to have an override mechanism but those two sorts of feedback having an active volume type in the query and shown here and um, are probably really important for understanding what the results actually are yeah for sure i'll, I'll show you an example i can talk longer over here um. So, in here, um, let's see. So, right, as you type, you can you know, select the term of phrase senior software engineer. Um, you know, would be be on rails. You know, most of the time people are going to interact uh, interact with it this way. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. that You're five minutes ahead of me this time. <laughs> <laughs> the of this way. 
What's that? The, the, the type I hate on this whole video is too much. Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, so usually when people are intera interacting with us, they're going to be you know, interacting with the autocomplete as opposed to typing the whole phrase. But, um, you know, uh, what's a good example? Uh, good one. Senior Java developer Ruby on Rails developer Perl. If I run that search. <coughs> so, you know, senior Java developer was parsed out. Ruby on Rails was parsed out. Hadoop developer was parsed out. Perl was parsed out. Um, so that's you know, it allows the it allows the user to, uh, if they want to, um, just you know, copy and paste the boolean phrase or copy and paste the long phrase and type it in. Um, but you know, there are normal users they're going to actually you know interact with the autocomplete, and it uh, will basically not allow them to do something that they don't intend because they'll fix it as they go. Sure. But say a different segmentation uh, to do anything about that? Run multiple queries for instance, see which one is the most popular. You know what I'm going to say, right? Yes. That's coming up next. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's semantic query parsing. You guys saw that in action. Um, one of the important things that we do here is that we build a probabilistic query parser. So there's actually two parts to our query parser. One is we tie back to that list of, ta of that taxonomy that I mentioned earlier that we mined from our query logs. Uh, but also, we know that not everything that people are going to search for is going to be something we've seen before. <coughs> Therefore, we built a probabilistic query parser that ties into um, our underlying inverted index and our content to be able to figure out statistically uh, what um, the most likely phrases are they typed in. So, you know, the general idea here is that if someone types in senior Java developer in Hadoop, um, you know, there's all these different ways to parse that. Which one's right, and how do you how do you know which one's right? Um, and we won't always know. Sometimes we'll be wrong, but uh, we basically you know think of it basically as kind of applying naive Bayes um, using the underlying statistics that are in the inverted index. So um, I won't walk through the code example. The slides will be available later. You guys can get a good feel for what it's doing here. But you know, to give you a visual example, we um, in Solar implemented a request handler which allows you to pass in that phrase, Senior Hadoop Developer Java Ruby on Rails Perl. Um, and uh, it will take the different variations and try to score them. So in this case, it says, you know, Senior Hadoop Developer gets a score of you know, 0.03. Developer Java Ruby gets a score of 0. That's not a phrase. It doesn't really occur in documents. Um, it, it definitely doesn't work that way. Developer Java is not a phrase. Java Ruby is not a phrase. Java Ruby on is not. Java Ruby is not. Ruby on actually does appear very commonly as a phrase, but Ruby on Rails is more statistically likely to be what you intended because of the completion of that. And then Rails will this in the And so by, um, by leveraging the underlying statistics within the Lucene index, um, we can actually figure out what the most likely parsing of the phrases is. And once we've done that, we Generally speaking, we would rely on it, but we also refer back to our underlying taxonomy. And if there's something that the taxonomy knows that the index uh, was uh, questionable on, we'll actually allow that to override what's coming back from the probabilistic parser. Yes? So, so how could you use the, uh, the phrase to change to what's going on here? But I mean, an example I'm thinking of, suppose somebody typed loop de developer senior. Would that, uh, would that be watering, um, which might be a personal preference? Would that actually uh, give you a completely different result in this case? Uh, so the question was, if you reorder the words, for example, say Hadoop developer senior, because that's your personal preference in terms of how you want to express that, <coughs> would that break the parser, or would it, you get a different parser? And the answer is yes. So the parser is based upon uh, what you know commonly occurs within your content and within your you know by the users running searches on your system. So if you uh, speak like Yoda. Uh, when you're typing your queries, then we are going to parse it accordingly. So, you know, Hadoop at the end will be its own thing. Uh, what was your example? Uh, Hadoop developer senior. Hadoop developer senior, yes. So what you're going to find is Hadoop developers who are, you know, over the age of 65. <laughs> um, and that's just how it's going to work. <laughs> I'm sorry. So don't, don't do that. <laughs> so yep. th this part seems like a really 
Uh, well, this confuses me a little because at, at some point the, on the set of head, you're telling us that your query log is quite important to this taxonomy and everything. Yeah. But this part looks like deeply tied to your actually your corpus of data, right? Like you're actually figuring this out from your document, mm -hmm. and then the intersection between your query log and your corpus. Right now, so this is the part that, that's turning confusing. How did you? How did you blur the line, or is it actually like... There's a lot of lines that are going in many different directions than everything I'm showing you. It's not, um, it's not simple. Uh, what I will say, though, is that for the semantic query parsing, and for the autocomplete, and for most of the stuff I've showed you, uh, we build um, sidecar indexes to do this. I mean, we, we, uh, the semantic parsing here is based upon a language model. The language model happens to be an inverted index that we've built. But it's not the same as the index that you know the a customer has. So, for example, we might have a customer who only has ten documents in their index. If we tried to run this on their index, it would be complete garbage. So we don't do that. What we do is we take a good representative sample of our domain and build a build an index that is for no other purpose than, than to be our golden standard language model. It's supposed to be representative of our domain, and then we run our semantic query parser on top of that index to get these stats. It's on the side. And for autocomplete, we build a semantic autocomplete capability where you know we've, we've built that taxonomy from linear query logs, but it's on the side. Now, for autocomplete, we do want to get autocomplete, autocomplete on the underlying documents as well and merge the two. But that's, you know, I haven't really even gone into that tonight. That's, that's a side thing. So essentially, here, you're building a whole NLP language, uh, NLP ending together, it seems. Right, because yeah, you could think of it that way. Yeah, so he, he asked, you know, are we building an NLP engine here? Um, you know, we kind of are. The, um, the, I would say that, for, at least for the um, creation of taxonomy, the nice thing is that it's not language uh, dependent. It's, it's a language independent approach by my query logs. Um, this is language dependent uh, for the, the semantic parsing and the probabilistic parsing in that, you know, we're assuming um, positions between terms. So for example, um, our ch a Chinese index would have to be tokenized appropriately for the Chinese language to be able to do this, though otherwise it would still it would work as long as things were tokenized appropriately. Um, yeah, you can think of it that way. Spanish and English would switch the two words. Right, right. But we would have a dedicated index for Spanish versus English. Yep. Okay, so to, to tie this back in together, you know, I talked about the probabilistic parser and I talked about our taxonomy. The, um, the general query parsing architecture looks like this. Um, you know, first of all, we create that taxonomy by, by minor our query logs. Um, secondly, we feed those query logs into a project that's called the Solar Text Tagger. Um, are you, how many of you guys are familiar with what a finite state transducer in Lucene is? Anybody? One? Okay, um, high level, it's just, it, I won't go into details, just think of it as a really, really fast, um, compact um, representation of an, of an inverted index of, um, in a graph format where you can do very fast lookups. So, for example, I can take an entire resume, pass it to the solar text tagger, and it will tell me every term that appears in my inverted index that's in that document in about a millisecond. Um, so that's that's the power that it provides without going into any of the technical implementation. Um, that's what we use it for. So in this case, um, we, we feed the solar text tagger with our entire taxonomy. We use the text tagger to perform entity extraction on incoming queries and documents. And then we um, invoke the probabilistic parser I just spoke with you about a few minutes ago. And um, you know, it kind of looks like what you see over here on the right, where the query of software engineer and Hadoop Java comes in. We pass it to the um, FST, the solar text tagger, and it tells us that it found software engineer, Hadoop, and Java, and it tells us the position in the text where it found each of those things, which allows us to replace the text with a token representing software engineer, Hadoop, and Java, and then that becomes our representation of the query. And then for each of those tokens, we can now, in our rewriting phase, go in and substitute anything there we want, uh, which might include other related terms and phrases, boosts, for relevancy, those kinds of things. And then we move on to our query augmentation phase. So assuming we went through that whole parsing step, and one of the things that we parsed out was uh, the phrase machine learning. Uh, what do we do then? We pass machine learning into our semantic query augmentation phase, 
and it pulls in things like related phrases, common job titles associated with that phrase, um, occupational classifications. Um, and it gets all of those from our semantic knowledge graph, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, also, that is built on an inverted index as a sidecar index, so you, know, you can probably see a theme here. Uh, we, we use the search engine very heavily to inform the search engine about how it should do better as a search engine. <laughs> yeah, that, that was my question I was waiting for the end, because at some point, it seems like a relational database is not used to me, right? So, what, like, I guess you store your user information for logins there, but mm -hmm. it seems like everything, you're pretty much safe as using a relational engine like Solar to, to model all your data. So that, that was mm -hmm. the question, how, how you intersect, like, where those relational comes in? It's pretty interesting. Everything, at this point, everything looks like you don't even need a relational database. Uh, nothing I've showed you needs a relational database. Okay. Yep. We got a popular speaker here a couple times, Ted Donnie, and you know, like yeah, yeah. the four yeah, key yeah. algorithms for practical machine, uh, data mining machine learning. And, the, and the, his fourth principle is uh, search engine abuse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> use search engine for recommendations and yep. search and everything else. Yeah. The, the inverted index is my favorite data structure. You can do a lot with it. So, so the similar thing I have actually, you know, why does US Solar has all those components, right? They're pretty much actually made by US Solar, right? Most of the people are, you know, who I have interacted with, actually, they do everything on the right? right. The only thing Solar is being used for doing the data and the data stuff. Yeah, so the question was, uh, in solar, um, it you know, probably applies to any search engine. What, you know, why does it have all these built-in components that people are just doing all this stuff outside the search engine? Yeah, um, and you know, it's it's probably important to point out we're not like everything we're doing here ultimately is still going back into the search engine and using the search engine to do it. But but you know, we're not using the you know solar auto suggest component. We're not using the solar spell check, and we're not using those things. We're you know using our own on top of the inverted. Um, you know, it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes if, if you've got, if you work in a shop where you need to get search up and running, it's really easy to get up and running with all of, you know, all of these capabilities of <coughs> turning them on. But if you want to do something that's very very domain specific, um, sometimes you're going to have to either build your own or, or customize or, you know, do, do it slightly differently. So. Because domain specific says, like, you can't get a basic, a basic. I mean, it will give you the basic Yep. Yep. Yeah, you, even at the beginning of the stuff I talked about, you know, a new search engine, a movie search engine, where you're going to modify the relevancy. You know, that's what, once you move beyond just basic keyword search, you're you're going to have to do those things. Now, you're still leveraging the core information retrieval engine to do it, um, but you know, you're you know, it, it's not going to figure out your domain. <coughs> you're going to have to tell it what your domain looks like, and it, it can you know give you really relevant results and model your query appropriately. But you have to you have to do your part too. Um, okay, so you know this is just the query augmentation phase. We take machine learning in, we check with our knowledge graph, and based upon that knowledge graph, we um, you know, generate a more relevant query, send that to Solar, and that's how we ultimately get the results coming back. Uh, so this is um, just these are a few examples when you hit our semantic search API of, of what you get back. So um, if I type in the query of the dupe, then you know the things coming back from our knowledge graph are. You know, the, the most common job titles associated with Hadoop, um, the most common related keywords associated with Hadoop. If I pass in an entire document instead of a query, this is a, for, a document for an accounts table clerk, you see you know, the job title classification, occupational classifications, and you know, the skills that were you know, found within that document. And we can use those as the basis to form a query to do content based. You know, it's basically a content based recommendation at that point when you turn that into a, into a search. So you can use a document as your query, in other words. Um, and this is an example of what I'll show you in just a second with our knowledge graph, where we take this document, leverage the solar text tiger to extract out all of the terms in that document that were in our taxonomy that we got from mining our query blocks. And then after we've extracted them, we've, we've built um, a knowledge graph on the inverted index that's able to score any keyword and list of keywords, or you know, in, any entity and list of entities in the field um, based upon their statistical correlation within the inverted index. So not um, raw counts of co-occurrence like you would get with, with facets or aggregations, but actual statistic 
correlation. So I, I'll watch you in a one second. But what, what you see for this document for big data engineer, the top most interesting keyword phrases found were data engineer, big data, Hadoop, Hive, and MapReduce. And so I can basically boil the document down to <coughs> these and turn around and run those as the search to find other relevant documents um, using our knowledge graph. So the idea behind our knowledge graph API is um, to, to basically build it out as a data science toolkit that we can use internally um, that will allow us to dynamically navigate and pivot through multiple levels of relationships between items in our domain. So uh, you compare the relationships of skills to keywords, job titles to skills to keywords, skills to government occupation codes, skills to experience level. You, know, you can basically slice and dice the data in any direction as many levels as you want and see the statistical correlation of things and tell what's related to what else. Um, so a couple of things we can do with this. One, um, it serves as our core similarity engine that's exposed by an API. Um, it has full domain support for all of our taxonomies in our domain. And then, um, like I said, you know, we can look at for intersections and overlaps between things. If I want to, you know, skill by skill matrix or a job title by skill by job title matrix, I can figure out, um, you know, what the most uh, related things within that are. Um, and this is basically how it works. Um, it does foreground background analysis. Uh, similar to a statistically improbable phrase kind of algorithm. Um, you think of it basically it's just a z-score. So the idea is if I have the keyword to dupe and I pass that into um, solar um, and I also pass in the keywords um, beehive.net java registered nurse and teacher, then uh, what I'm asking it to do is tell me how related all of these words are to my original search of Hadoop. And so what it comes back with is, okay, well, Hive has a relatedness of 0.97. Java is a little bit less related, is at 0.92. .NET is still correlated heavily with Hadoop, but is much less correlated than Hive or Java. Uh, and then B has no correlation whatsoever in our domain, even though you know, Beehive, you would think they'd be correlated in our domain, but not at all because we don't have the keywords looking for jobs on our site. Um, but Hive is related to Hadoop. Um, teacher is negatively correlated with Hadoop, meaning you know that's an entirely different specialty. It doesn't occur commonly. And registered nurse is also negatively correlated. And so that's just an example of what sort of statistical analysis does. It's basically just a z-score where you're you know, looking at a normal distribution and you're saying, um, you know, does the word hive statistically appear more often with Hadoop um, than it would in just the general population of all documents? That's basically the question we're asking. Um, or does it occur negatively? Like, does it does um, you know, registered nurse occur less often with Hadoop than it would in the general population? The answer is yes. That's basically the question we're asking here. So you can think of it sort of like doing facets or aggregations, but where instead of um, counting, or instead of the value being the count, instead it's the statistical correlation. And so some of the kinds of things we can do with this, uh, we can discover relationships between anything. So if you know, I could ask in our domain, if I want to become a data scientist and know Python, what library should I learn? I could ask, if my last job was a mid-level software engineer and my current job is engineering lead, what are my most likely next roles? The way we would do that is by pivoting from, you know, two jobs ago to the current job and then, you know, predicting out what the next job would be. Uh, I can traverse arbitrarily deep and sort on anything. Uh, we can use this for cleaning data. So if I have um, a taxonomy that I mine from my query logs, which you guys all know we do at this point, because uh, I've said that 20 times at least, um, then what we can do is say, we can ask this for all of these, this list of related keywords, which of them actually are, are dirty? Which of them shouldn't be in there? Based upon looking for things that actually have a negative, or no correlation or a negative correlation in our data with the original keyword. Um, we can build user profiles from search logs. So if I have someone who searches for Java and then jQuery and then CSS and then JSP, I can figure out what those have in common, what the intersection and overlap is within the underlying data with other skills and titles. And um, you know, if they search for Java and then C++ and then simply what the intersection and overlap is there. Because even though the word Java appeared in both, the understanding of that relationship between all those things is, is actually very different um, in those two contexts. And then uh, finally, I can crosswalk between types. So if I, if I have an ID field that wants to enable a free text search uh, to find the most commonly associated, associated ID, not the most commonly associated ID with any keyword that was typed in, I could allow someone to basically do a keyword search 
and then map it to the most likely ID, and then you know return that ID. Um, or you know, if I have a geo box um, that only accepts state, so I can only search on U.S. state, then I could allow someone to type in um, some other location, like a city, and they could actually figure out what the state's supposed to be, and then search on the state that way, just by looking at that statistical correlation. Um, and then finally, um, if I have an old classification taxonomy and I have a new classification taxonomy, I need to map the value from the old one to the new one. I can cross log very easily to do that. Question? Uh, so in this knowledge graph, what kinds of types of page types and new types are there? That's a great question. I completely lost over that. So um, a graph database allows you to add nodes and edges. This is a specialized case of a graph database, and it's not actually a graph database. Um, it, it's an inverted index. And so specifically, <laughs> specifically uh, think of every term in the inverted index as a node, and every document as an edge. So the inverted index is a graph of mapping all terms with each other based upon the relationship between documents. And so as I'm navigating through this, I say Hadoop is my node, and then based upon all the documents that link Hadoop to something else, I'm measuring the relationship using those. So your inverted index is a graph database, a specialized case of one. Sure, sure. Um, and what, what that means, though, with a traditional graph database, you can arbitrarily add as many nodes and edges as you want. In this particular case, my nodes and edges all come from real-world data, which are my documents. And it's, it's much harder to, for example, add a new edge between two nodes, because to do that, I have to index as many documents as I need the strength of that edge to be. So it's not a generalized graph database, but it, what it does is it accurately models your domain um, in such a way that your graph database is built with real-world knowledge that you can then mine to understand relationships between things without having to model them explicitly. Yeah. The false question seems to be pretty long and plays such an important role in the system. And you have, it doesn't matter if it's a real graph database, but conceptually, it's still a graph structure with all that matters. Yeah. So, does the query log participate in this knowledge graph at all, or is it the same point just so the question is, we keep talking about the query log. I've mentioned it at least 22 times now. Um, does that play a role in this uh, knowledge graph? Um, the answer is yes, but uh, only to the degree that it helps populate it. Meaning, uh, when I take a document to put it in the knowledge graph, otherwise known as in, uh, indexing it into the inverted index, I first pass it through that solar text tagger, which extracts out all of the entities within the documents that were in my query logs that I mined. So I mine, I mine the query logs. After I mine the query logs, I have my taxonomy. Every document that comes in is checked against that taxonomy, and all of the things that taxonomy are extracted out as entities. And then those entities all get indexed into separate fields in the knowledge graph so that you can navigate between them. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming this is a pretty iterative process. So as you improve these taxonomies, yep. terms, do you then have to go re-ingest the entire document sets to you know run them through the new set of FSDs? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the question is every time we have some iteration, do we have to reprocess all the documents? Um, and you know, it sounds like a lot of processing, do we have to do all over again? The answer is yes. And, and do you have sort of a fixed engineering cycle to do that or is it more ad hoc? We've got enough terms, we should do it again. Yeah. Um, conceptually, think of everything as running constantly. So th think of it as, you know, we mine our query logs, that kicks off you know, a long workflow where we, we build all the different stages, and at the very end, we have the entire system built. I would think of it that way. There are some pieces in between where we have a data analyst you know, look at something before pushing a button, but conceptually, this whole system is constantly rebuilding itself. And once it gets to the end, it uses the end to train the beginning, and then it goes, it just, you know, it's a constant cycle. And it's a lot of data processing. Yes? So I understand that uh, the inverted index, which um, um, builds the relationship between the term and the document, is your primary database. But uh, in order to answer a question like, uh, given data scientists and Python was a library, you need the term-to-term -term relationship, right? How do you 
retrieve, uh, do we need to build a secondary uh, database to? No, we, um, so in a graph database, you would take a node, you would navigate a relationship to another node, and then you can navigate a relationship to a third node, right? So you, it's the same thing here. We've, um, I, I can probably pull up an example. I'll pull up an example at the end and, and show you guys. Um, should I have? No, I don't have an example here. Um, I, I can show you a, a live example of what it's doing, but basically I can say, I want to start with, I want to search for Hadoop, I want to uh, find all the top job titles associated with it, and then I want to find all the skills associated with those, and then I want to find all the um, you know occupations associated with those. So it's it's a you you navigate from any node to any other kind of node um, based upon the documents in between, and you can do that as many um, through as many dimensions as you want to. So use two hop from term to document and document to term as a one conceptually as correct, one hop. Correct. From node correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, that every edge is is um, going through documents. Um, term, terms, terms being the nodes go to document, uh, go through a document as the edge to another term, which is another node. And you can do that as you, you can go as many dimensions as you want. So yes, you always hop through the documents. Uh, is there yeah. an advantage to actually doing the other way, having the document the node and the terms of the purchases? Now, if you're trying to use an inverted index as a graph database. <laughs> it's interesting, like, uh, graph database is like Neo 4 j they mm -hmm. are actually, you know, uh, not SQL close as a team index. Mm -hmm. So I'm, sh I'm pretty sure they're close to it, but uh, just here, like, maybe, that yeah. Well, I guess I, I answered my own question. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> what is an inverted index? Typically, if you're talking about text at least, it's taking a bunch of text, tokenizing it, and then indexing the individual um, terms map it back to the right to the document. Um, I mean, you can flip that around, but then it's not really an inverted index anymore. Um, and yeah, you can build a graph database that way, but it's going to be done more manually. So, um, you know, the, the main benefit of this approach is that we get a graph database that we can navigate relationships between that fully represents our domain without having to understand our domain. Like, literally, if all of that knowledge, that semantic knowledge, those semantic relationships, are embedded within the content and the relationships between terms within the content. So we're that that's the information we want. We want to know which terms are related to which other terms, when they co-occur together, um, and you know which terms are like. For example, if we were to um, go with a more naive approach, which some of our competitors do, uh, which is, uh, hey, I want to figure out what the top skills are associated with Hadoop. What they would do, the easiest thing to do is just do a facet and say, well, I'm going to search on Hadoop and then facet on the skills and see what the top skills that come back are. And what you'll see, Hive, HBase, Pig, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Access, well, Access is in that pocket, but why do, Word and, why do Word and Excel show up so commonly with Hadoop? Because everybody has them. Because from a co-occurrence standpoint, they're very popular and everybody has them. If I look for any other skill, you know, Microsoft Office, Word, Excel, those are going to show up as well. The problem is that Word, Office, and Excel are not statistically correlated with many domains specifically. They're generally correlated with every domain. Um, there's some that don't have them and some that have them more than others, but generally speaking, they're consistent across everything. It's just like the notion in TFIDF where you look at words like A and B and of, and they have almost no weight because they're so common among every document. Whereas, you know, a more specific word, engineering would be better than B, um, Hadoop would be better than engineering because it's more specific. So it's the same kind of thing. With this statistical correlation measurement that we're doing, we're saying not does Hive or Pig or Office occur more times with Hadoop. We're saying is it statistically skewed towards Hadoop and away from the general population of documents? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. Just trying to get this. Would it be fair to say that the doing tokenization, the time to go to the knowledge graph, it goes beyond you know, just you know, you know, skimmer tokenization or something or anything like that, but your tokens now have as much as possible have been resolved for census. So by the time you reach those nodes, they have been resolved for census wherever possible, and then they join up in the knowledge graph. Uh, that, that's the goal. I would say we're not quite there, but that's the goal. But if you're on the continuum. Yeah, yeah. So, um, another way, and I, I probably, but me, I, I don't know for time, 
but we'll probably do it in a second. Um, probably let me just show you an example of interacting with the knowledge graph. Uh, but think of it as having a keywords field that you can do any random keyword or phrase or Boolean combination in, as well as a skills field, a job title field, you know, all the different kinds of entities we have fielded it out. And so when you are trying to discover something, um, you probably are going to search on the keyword field, but then you're going to say discover terms for me in the skills field, and then score those relative to the keywords I search. Uh, and so it's like they're, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just about the same. There's an uh, aggregation in Elasticsearch called the significant terms. Yep. Familiar with it. It's kind of similar to what it does in terms of foreground versus background analysis. Um, it is similar. It is. Also, it's similar. It's not. It, it's a little bit different, but I'm not going to go into that. Yep. Other <coughs> questions on that? I hope we got back to the question. Okay, we'll do that. Um, and I think that's, yeah, so th these are, um, you guys obviously know I have focus lore in action, but we'll figure out how to give a book away at the end. Um, and um, I, I think I mentioned this specifically, but, um, you know, if you took a picture or anything, you know, tweet about the talk, say something interesting, you know, I've got five books to give away, so I'll, you know, look in the morning and see if anyone had anything interesting to say and, uh, you know, give you guys, give someone a book. Um, this is a list of research publications between our search and Data science team over you know 2014-2015. A lot of the stuff I talked about is included in these papers. Um, but feel free, you know, if you have questions, feel free to send me an email. Um, it'll be on the last slide. And you guys will have the slides available later. Um, also, you know, we're hiring. If anyone wants to move away from the beautiful sun out here to the beautiful sun <laughs> in Atlanta, where it's actually you know just as warm, um, you know, feel free to you know, send me an email or come talk with me. Uh, and just to give you guys a feel for what's next for us. So most of the stuff I talked about here with, in terms of personalization, um, you know, uh, keyword, search, keyword search and semantic search was about understanding our domain and understanding the user's query and modeling it. The one area that we've um, invested less in to this point is that last mile, which is understand, you know, taking all that information and modeling it back into the engine as the best query to get the most relevant results. And so, um, you know, we talked about all of this, but the last piece that we're, we're really moving towards is, uh, is focusing on learning to rank. And so it's, you know, taking all of that information, figuring out how to use those features and how to get the best possible, um, th this modified query here, how to make this the best it possibly can be. Um, and most folks, when they do learning to rank, they focus on training a generalizable algorithm for the whole search engine that is used for everybody. And what we actually want to do is on a per uh, category basis and a per keyword basis actually have a different relevancy algorithm. So if someone searches for Java developer, the relevancy algorithm and all the features are going to be very different than if they search for, um, you know, waiter or server or something like that. Um, and so that that's the general direction we're going in. We um, we've got some good designs in place that we're starting to implement. So if I you know come back here you know anytime in the future maybe I can talk about some of that. But uh, that's the next frontier for us. So that was our intent engine. That's the conceptual framework in which I'm working. Some other um, slides and presentations and kind of stuff that you guys want to investigate in any of this more. And if you want to contact me, um, you can go to my website, shrakeranger.com. Um, or if you want solar in action, you can go to solarinaction.com. Um, if you don't get a free book, then there's a discount code there for 39% off if you want to buy one. And like I said, we're hiring, so come talk with me if you're interested. And that's it. So I'll take some questions, and I don't even know what time we need to stop. Uh, pretty soon. Let, let's give our speaker a hand real quick. Yeah. <laughs> wants to go, and uh, why don't we just break into like half an uh, What What about the book? Is there some like random way I can uh, get the book out, or some? Extraordinarily good. What's the best question? Why don't you ask a good question? Who, who, who do you guys think has the best question? What's that a picture of on the cover? Uh, don't ask. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, What's your best question? Public domain. It, 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 it's on the um, it's on like the fourth page. It explains it in detail. If you buy a copy, you'll. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a secret. I don't know. Maybe we're going to pay for the consulting services. What's that?
this and maybe the gentleman who came for the consulting services somebody had a lot of questions over on yeah, the yeah, side. yeah yeah somebody who, asked the questions there who doesn't have a copy that wants one <laughs> I'll start with you guys I'm, okay okay put your hand down if you didn't ask any questions <laughs> Comment counts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Would you all Because every other digital topic, I would love it. I was here. I think. Which one? We were talking. Very in there. Okay. He asked those questions. All right. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I'll sign it um, after if you want. Um, guys, what, uh, can I take a few questions or do you guys want to see a okay. demo? You guys want to see a demo? Okay. All right, let me see if I can. Oh, awesome, awesome. <laughs>